We are a team of composers, sound designers, and technologists, and we use sound and music to create auditive environments that immerse listeners in artistic, historical, or sometimes commercial contexts. Uh, we were founded in 2005, and as you can see, we are quite small. On this image, you can actually see the whole team. And our core expertise lies in something we call sound sonography. I'll talk more about this in a minute, but just as a quick summary right now, um, we're designing, designing sounds for spaces, be it for sound installations, exhibitions, or also for live performance. We're based in Basel, Switzerland. Um, our studios are located in a former industrial area uh, of a machine factory, actually. And it is now used for a wide range of purposes, including metalworking, artist ateliers, and as you can see here on this picture, even honey farming, the same as what's happening on this campus, as I've learned yesterday. This is our main studio. And in 2016, um, we built this tailor-made sound dome, which you can see on top, like this construction, um, to realize productions for highly complex loudspeaker configurations, because in most of our projects, we have tailor-made sound systems that are custom-made for the particular purpose at hand. And usually, we work in a consulting role when it comes to the technical design of these setups. So the uh, setup in our studio is designed to be as flexible as possible with the idea being that we can approximate the conditions on site on any given project we're working on. Uh, we're doing also a lot of research within and around sound and sound sonography in various fields such as tactile sound design and also the intersection of sound and taste. On the occasion of our 15th anniversary, a few years ago, um, we published this book together. Um, it's about sound sonography. And if you're interested, it's also, you can find it on the table in the next door entrance area. As a discipline that developed out of sonography and exhibition design, sound sonography is primarily used in exhibition settings such as museums, media installations and this is the main field we work in we call sound sonography the art of designing sound for spaces as the title of our book suggests and we think that sound is incredibly underestimated and also underused as a design medium especially when when it comes to a spatial context because the way a space sounds has an incredible impact on how we feel when we move within it and this is the strength we systematically try to harness when we do our sound sonography work. By composing soundscapes in multi-channel formats, we try to seamlessly integrate sound into architecture, or much rather we try to see sound as a part of architecture. So similarly to the way lighting kind of reveals the characteristics of a space visually, um, sound can do the same to our ears. Uh, we've been lucky enough to work on projects around the globe. Some of the more recent ones include the sound sonography for the newly opened Holocaust gal galleries in London. And this was an interactive exhibition about silence at the Museum of Communication in Bern, Switzerland, in which counterintuitively, perhaps 90% of the content was conveyed through sound. So acoustic ecology is one of our main interests and we are quite active in the field. Most recently, we founded a new listening series together with artists such as Markus Mädel, Ludwig Berger and Christian Zehndl. And we're actually in the process of co-founding a Swiss affiliate organization to the WF WFAE, but that is top secret, of course. In our projects, um, Sound ecology is present in two ways. For one, it has crucially impacted the way we work, our core principles when we practice sound sonography. And the second aspect is that also found its way into a lot of our project as a main topic. I'd like to talk a little bit about the former first. 
all the core principles of composition and sound design for our spatial compositions are borrowed from nature and our interaction within it. First one is orientation. In outdoor spaces, humans and other animals use sounds that surround them for orientation purposes. Acoustic landmarks such as waterfalls help them figure out their location within their environment. This is especially important, of course, in situations with low visibility or at night. And the way these sounds are reflected and filtered also reveals a lot of information about the characteristics of an environment, for example, the materials present in it. So in indoor environments, when we do our work, such orientation can only take place in a similar way if we consciously design such acoustic landmarks in our sound scenography, and that's what we're aiming to do. Attention. Unlike visual information, um, sounds have an effect on humans and other animals, regardless of whether they're actively listening or not. Also, our sense of hearing is global and omnidirectional. And uh, we can pick a lot of information, pick up a lot of information at once through our ears, comparison to sight, where we only have this one tiny spot that is in focus at a given time. And in nature, the sense of hearing is crucial to spot potential dangers, of course, and vice versa, also to help predators detect potential prey. And in man-made environments, such as exhibitions, we try to harness these qualities of sound um, to purposefully direct the attention of visitors. Oops. Association. In nature, various sounds contain crucial information. The specific characteristics of wind sounds, for example, or the occurrence of particular animal sounds can reveal information about upcoming weather changes, for example. And such cues can be learned by humans and other animals to more intuitively navigate their environment. In sound scenography, we use this quality of sound to condense complex emotions into short sound cues. For example, if you were to direct a little experiment, if you were to play the first double bass note of a famous soundtrack, such as for Spielberg's Jaws, to a random group of people in a room, there's quite a high likelihood that at least one of them would immediately know what it is and connect it to the film. And in that way, like in a split second, the whole emotional world of a whole movie is being triggered and reactivated. Spatial depth. A single sound or a single point source is giving us very limited spatial information. This little bird chirping in the snow would be an example for that. But if two or more point sources are combined with a physical distance or offset between them, a three-dimensional listening space opens up. The great number of point sources present in most nature um, soundscapes with imagine like a lot of birds or insects that we can hear in this campus right here is the reason why nature spoils us with soundscapes with tremendous spatial depth. And this is also something we try to emulate in our work by composing for a great number of discrete audio channels and mixing sounds spatially. So walking around in um, composed soundscapes like this is actually a little bit of a similar experience to walking around in a natural soundscape in nature. So to come full circle, acoustic ecology has also found its way into many of our projects as a core topic. The first one I'd like to talk about is Kwatu. It's a Sun Heritage Center near Cape Town. It's um, the only heritage center in the world that is dedicated to the sun, which are the hunter-gatherer cultures in the African Southwest. Its exhibition documents the daily lives of the sun, the gentle ways of coexisting with their biosphere around them has actually taught us quite a lot about sound ecology. Sound plays a crucial way, uh, a crucial role in their everyday activities 
sounds of their environment and the fauna um, provide a lot of information to them. Here again, they get a lot of information about weather changes or also um, information about it, the changing and the progress of the seasons. So we've been lucky enough to be allowed to tag along with the sun when they were going um, about their daily business in the Kalahari Desert in Namibia. Using this ORTF 3D rig that you can see on this picture to record as much as possible along the way. We were joining them in various activities, such as hunting trips and ceremonies, and basically trying to hear the world through their ears as much as we could. Here okay, we're trying to record a herd of elephants in the Kalahari Desert. So drawing from this rich material, we then created a 21 channel soundscape composition in the exhibition of the Heritage Center. There are only very few sun left that still live as hunter gatherers today and at a similar pace in which they are disappearing, nature around them is also disappearing. So the focus of this project was um, to preserve a version of today's acoustic reality and to make it accessible to today's population but also to future generations. That's very much the thinking that aligns with efforts such as the UNESCO World Heritage Program, for example, but with a focus on sound. A project which is still ongoing is the Klangweg Tockenburg. It's a public hiking trail in the alpine environment in Switzerland's Tockenburg region. And on these pictures, you can see the existing version of the trail, but it is now being completely redesigned and we are overseeing this pro process from a sound perspective. And in the new version, hikers on this trail will be able to discover many sound art pieces by various artists. And these are integrated into the sound sphere of the surrounding ecosystem and hereby function as an extension of it hopefully sensitizing visitors regarding the, its liability to sound pollution. So in a piece by landscape sound artist Ludwig Bergel, for example, the trail will branch out into um, five different sections, each of which will then feature a different rock type with a different specific grain size. And um, when walking on each of these five sections, the footsteps of hikers will actually create a sound that resembles the sound spectrum of a specific kind of cricket, respectively. To mimic these crickets even more, there's a visual aid or like a visual score of sorts that helps um, visitors imitate the rhythm of the clitter of the crickets. And there are many more, or 24 more sound pieces like that, that um, all deal with acoustic ecology in a creative way. One of which will also be created by Swiss artist, Markus Mädel, who's sitting here and will be speaking um, in an hour, I believe on this stage. For the exhibition Earth at its Limits at Natural History Museum in Basel in Switzerland, we created three spatial soundscapes which simulated the idea of untouched nature. The exhibition grappled with the notion that this kind of pristine environment, which is untouched by humans, is quickly turning into a relic of the past, one that soon can only be experienced um, in an artificially created soundscape. As a counterpoint, we also created a fourth soundscape this one featured sounds of various natural disasters. The same museum is currently planning a comprehensive new building, which you can see on these visualizations. And we are working on multiple concepts with them for the redesign. One of which features a life-size replica of a whale which uh, would be mounted on the ceiling in this huge staircase, which connects multiple exhibitions. 
And the plan is to connect the replica to the tracking device of an actual whale who is swimming in the ocean. The live data will then reveal the current depth in which the actual animal is swimming in, from which we can then derive its heart rate. And the sound of its heartbeat would then be played back through a huge subwoofer, which is integrated into the body of the replica whale. I think this is all we have time for, right? So I'm happy to take questions or talk to you later. Thank you. So the question is if the heartbeat that is being played back is um, a sonification or an actual heartbeat. And it's this is only in a concept phase because this um, is going to be built in 2026, I want to say. Um, but there are actual recordings of, of whale heartbeats, so it would should not be hard to uh, actually design it in a way that sounds like the actual whale's heartbeat and then to adjust the tempo uh, regarding the live data. That's a very good question. I think it's by being very open in the connections we try to build and, and emulate and not to get too like narrowed down to like be only interested in certain topics. And it kind of spirals out from that. It, a lot of uh, clients also come on board through another project that they've seen. Then they might come back to us and be like, uh, yeah, we want to have something similar or this inspired us to think about sound like that. And then it kind of takes its course like that. There's no system to it, if, if that's what your question is, but just basically trying to stay open. And on the flip side of this, we find it extremely um, fascinating to be exposed to these various different topics, because then within such a project you get the time to really learn about something deeply that you would not have otherwise spent so much time with which uh, in the example of the holocaust galleries for me um working four years on this project leading the sound creation process was also kind of um challenging because you spent four years uh with among other things like very highly um problematic content so every project has its new challenges and expands your horizons hopefully to some degree definitely <laughs> I would say like um, psychology is also kind of a different part in what we do in terms of how we try to gauge um, what, uh, how flexible a client can be in their own imagination. Because as you can imagine, like the museums also tend to like do the things the way they do them and to come in with sound as a core medium is kind of a, a weird idea to a lot of them to begin with. And then to really try to see how far you can stretch that and how far they're willing to come along with you on that ride is kind of an important aspect to be able to feel that out, you know. I would say very positive. Like, what, what would you say, Ramon? It was more like gathering the responses of being present with them during the recording process. 
that's that was my something more present. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. Um, some, but that's that's a very different project, though. Yeah. But I mean, in general, I can say that public responses are sometimes very different to what you anticipate them to be. Yeah. In the example of sounds of silence, that there was this big fear that it was going to be polarizing the public completely. Half the people would hate it because they couldn't like wrap their heads around this interactive sound installation. But it turns out that it was quite accessible, much more than we thought. Mm -hmm. 